disturbed by the song itself. Uh, yes, Kai the giant, great who success. is uncharacteristically quiet, seems to take a slight interest in in what you're playing and actually sits down on the stairs to the upper portion of the deck to listen. Dunwood, who has been walking around the deck observing the damage to the mainmast and other portions of the ship, you can see he's got a, a rather troubled look on his face. He begins to pull himself away from from what he's focused on and, and listen to the music at least for a little bit, and you swear you see a little bit of the tension start to leave his face. He lets out another heavy sigh and a small smile appears, and he actually heads down into the hold as well. Uh, before doing so, he yells up to the crewman that's in the crow's nest, Keep a sharp eye. The response as he disappears down into the hold is a succinct, Yes, Captain! Oh, I don't even have that character here. Give me a second. All right, Dunwood is now in the hold. Uh, the crewman, who finished his chug first, stands up rather quickly and surprisedly. And Dunwood just kind of waves his hand, and the crewman sits back down. And Dunwood heads over to the ale where Holg has actually not changed position at all. He has just been standing in front of the barrel, just continuing to pour himself ale, and just pounding it back. He looks over at Dunwood, and Dunwood looks over at him. And Holg then hands Dunwood the tankard of ale, and pours himself a new one. And Holg, for the first time in a while, shows a little bit of emotion, when he goes over and says, we won a great victory. No one forgotten. And everyone, cheers to their memories. And at that point, everyone else that is in the hold stops for a moment and, and is silent for a moment of contemplation. And then they all raise up their tankards. Everyone in the hold make a constitution saving throw. I'm not in the hold. What? Sorry about that. I'm back. Steve, make a constitution saving throw. What happened? Oh, God. You're chugging again. Oh, man. God, oh, man. Damn it. What was your previous one? Okay. 11. <laughs> All right, so. They just start, like, laughing while I'm chugging this time, instead of being some well, asshole uh, Hulk, who can't drink. He, he actually, apparently he's been drinking pretty fast, because he kind of misses part of his face, and, like, half of it spills down his shirt. And you just hear him, oh, 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 oh. and out of the corner, way, uh, you, uh, you crack into a bit of a smile, and some of the other crewmates who managed to successfully drink their drinks, are also starting to get a good of a, bit of a chuckle at this. Uh, the captain, who sees it as well, he... <laughs> and kind of sputters. The, uh, the ale itself is... It's an IPA. It has to, have last, it has to last through a sea, sea voyage, so it's a fairly high percentage. I don't like IPAs. Just real life. Oh, I don't mind. Let me go find the right kind. And uh, the music that's being played up top can be heard within the hold. Music? Yes. Uh, Danny. I had to remember that name. Uh, Danny is playing music up on the deck. Mm. And he's entertaining Pedwin and Kanye. 
the captain sits down across from one of his men. Ooh, hang on. He sits down, he says, let's have a game then. And we'll share stories of those who are no longer here. And with that, Holg seems to take the cue and sits down at the nearby table. Uh, The crewman who came down here initially, that would be this guy. He reaches under the desk and pulls out a small game board and a couple of bags of game pieces, and he and Captain Dunwood begin to play. You've been waiting for this, haven't you? Uh, I've planned for it, yes, but I, I don't have any, like, major ways of implementing it. Oh, okay. Because I was going to just say, I remember you talking about it. Well, yeah, but... That idea is going to come later. Oh, okay. I mean, if you want to play the game, you can totally just observe them or play one of them now if you would prefer to do that. I think I'm okay. I'll just observe for now, I guess. All right. Well, you're going to observe from uh, across the table from Holg. Observe while drinking. Holg is... None too happy at the fact that you were able to drink better than he was. So he looks at you and gives kind of a, a grunt. And he slams his arm down on the table in a uh, an arm wrestling challenge kind of fashion. And just stares deadpan at you. I slam my arm down too. Alright. This is going to be a straight up strength check from the two of you. I think I did the right one. Yes, you did. Oh, too bad about that second number. So... But I have an advantage on strength checks. You're not raging. You are not raging. Oh, damn it! I should have raged before. (laughs) You're gonna get enraged for an arm wrestle? Hey, you never know. Okay, yeah, I won't won't rage. (laughs) Well, I mean, you could, but... What is with my shitty rolls today? Stuff could happen if you rage. I'm just saying. Okay, I won't rage then. Fine, I won't. If you want to, man, you can. I'm not stopping. No, 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 it's okay. I won't rage. Okay, so... uh, Some of the the crewmen that are not playing, and even the ones that are, start to look out of the corner of their eye as, as beads of sweat are forming on the two of your brows, as you are just... Just these huge, muscly, meaty arms of these two guys are trying to overpower each other. But uh, Holg has a little bit of strength on you and just slowly starts to move your arm down. Uh, I want you to make a strength saving throw. Push him back. Damn it! I hate these rolls. Why can't we be taking the first number? (laughs) And uh, unfortunately, it is not enough, and Holg is able to pin your arm down, and he he immediately stands up and raises both arms in victory, and gives a big, and kind of pounds his own chest, and then proceeds to down the rest of his drink. (laughs) Some of the other crewmates, and uh, they find this quite entertaining, and they begin to, to chat amongst themselves, and with anyone else in the hold about some of the uh, amusing memories of their crewmates and the captain. Just odds and ends, little things that they said here and there, bits of wisdom and anecdotes, amusing memories. And uh, even Faisal from the corner of the room, who has been extremely quiet for everything. Everything? He is actually Everything. joined in the celebration as well, and he is he is drinking like a champ with the rest of them. As the night goes on, the party gets a little little bit more raucous. The uh, 
the drink is flowing, the laughter is getting louder and louder, a little bit more boisterous. People are starting to show signs of inebriation. There's a little bit of stumbling over chairs and slurred speech. And uh, at one point, Holg, who is, he's actually, he's starting to bust a little bit of a move to the music that's being played from above. And people are pointing and laughing, and everyone's generally having a good time. Even Captain Dunwood, he has a, a genuine smile on his face now. As in, like, as in, you know, he can see kind of the, uh, the brighter side of what's going on. You know, he can be thankful that he still has his ship, and he has most of his crew, and no, uh, no major harm was done. But uh, over the course of the evening, he seems to sink back into more of a, a somber state, and he actually stands up and kind of drunkenly wobbles his way over and exits back out onto the main deck. Are you still handstanding, Pedwin? How long does it take to uh, to divine the future? Uh, I don't know how long it takes to divine the future. I'm, I'm going to stay there as long as possible. All right, so for uh, the most accurate reading possible. Yep. Pedwin has... Uh, why don't you go ahead and make a dexterity saving throw? Do, 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 dexterity... Nope. <laughs> so he uh he sways a little bit and uh a sound of a clattering from within the hold kind of shakes his focus a little bit and Pedwin he kind of bounces on one hand trying to regain his balance and then bumps into the side of the boat and kind of falls prone. I, I gets jump himself up quickly up. and check myself for fire. He he jumps up quickly and checks himself for fire, and there was a little bit of, of smoke coming off of some of his clothes, but he quickly pats out the embers that were starting to kick up and shakes himself off. Dunwood then uh, approaches the group that are still up on top of the main deck, and he manages to, to regain a little bit of his eloquence, even though you can kind of see these swaying a little bit on his feet. We're not going to be at the shore until morning, you probably should turn in. And then just stumbles through the door to the captain's quarters. Danny goes to the edge of the ship to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and he, uh, he disappears into his, his cabin. Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and go to the edge of the ship then, Danny? The best part about being off the side of a ship is if you have a boner, you can pee up. And it will go over still. <laughs> so from... Uh, okay, so... Danny just goes to the side of the ship. And uh, urinates rather gracefully. He's, uh, he's standing on one tiptoe. And just pees right over the side of the boat. To no ill effect. Uh, the wind picks up a little bit and splashes some on his pants, which he quickly just kind of dusts off. The clattering from below deck is getting a little louder now. And Holg, who is, who is quite drunk at this point, he is starting to stumble around a little bit. And he's just coming over and basically catches an excerpt of a conversation between Big Mo and Faisal. And then sidles right, right up next to Big Mo and leans real close into his face. He says, what did you say about me? Wait, what did I say? Well, as far as you know, you didn't say anything, but he is right there in your face and his breath just reeks, reeks of alcohol. Uh... You got a problem with me? Well, come on then. And he actually pushes you a little bit. I push him back. You push Holg, and he, he takes a step back. He says, all right, now we got us an evening. And he 
puts together both of his fists. He drops his weapons, and he puts together both of his fists, and then the kind of drunken haze seems to clear a little bit as he starts fixating on you, and you can tell that clearly he wants to fight you. I'll put my fists up. All right. You uh, put your fists up. Have at ye. All righty. Uh, Do I have so, to roll for initiative? <laughs> it, you don't have to roll for initiative. Uh, he, You pushed him, so he has taken the first swing. Didn't he push me first? Well, yeah, but then you pushed him again. Oh, but yeah. he is so drunk that he, he swings totally wide and actually stumbles over the chair that you vacated to get in fighting stance. And then... Actually, wait, I'm going to do a, a dexterity save to see if he falls on his face. And he falls directly on his face. Uh... You can now hear the very loud sound of snoring. <laughs> and he appears to just completely relax and is seemingly quite content in this spot on the floor. All the other crewmates find this fucking hilarious, and they are they are laughing in their drunken stupor, and most of them begin to move toward the beds, which you do note, some of which have been destroyed, and while the bedding has been replaced, <laughs> there are not enough comfortable beds for everyone on the ship. I wonder how that happened. Uh... <laughs> I'll just uh, uh, go lie on the floor over here, I guess. Keep All right. An eye out for, uh, Ba. What was his name? It was his. That was his name. Do we know uh, about him? Uh, Big Mo and Pedwin certainly know about Boff. Oh wait, wait, yeah, okay, I know what you, I know who you're talking about. Now. I forgot his name. Oh. Okay, and uh, Basal just leans up against one of the barrels and promptly goes to sleep on top of a relatively comfortable sack of flour. Alright, everybody on deck, what are you guys doing as far as the last action of the evening? Uh, Danny has finished taking a dump over the side of the ship. Danny has finished taking a dump over the side of the ship. Did you, <laughs> you switch from peeing to taking a dump? <laughs> He's been there for a while, so I imagine you know, he had some business to do. <laughs> huh? I just took a dump. I'm gonna go ahead and stand in the center of the ship. And you should be able to move your character. Cast. I'm gonna stand more here-ish and cast Detect Magic. Okay, uh, give me a second to check some inventories. Womp womp. Womp womp. What's the range on Detect Magic? Uh, 30 feet. Womp womp. Better hang over the edge. I'll hold you over the edge if you want me to. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, standing. I want to catch the... The cabins? The cabins, completely, yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Detect magic. Uh, you... So you bring your, or Pedwin brings his hands close together to each other and, and mutters a small incantation and uh, a dim orange light begins to pass between his fingers and palms on both hands. And it then, uh, it then turns into a small cloud which expands and becomes very, very dissipated and difficult to see. But uh, you yourself begin to become aware more of your surroundings and you feel, uh, you do feel a slight... Uh, for lack of a better term, kind of pulse or resonance uh, from the captain's quarters in the shape of a long cylindrical object 
which you can only assume is the captain's saber, and as it continues to come into a little bit more clear resolution, you do recognize the shape of the the hilt and the handguard, and all of the the pieces of the saber that you've already seen, uh, and that is the only thing that you can detect at this moment. I'm gonna go to the other side of the boat. Go ahead. Actually, I'm gonna go under deck, underneath the deck. All right, you are joined by Kanye the Giant. Uh, Danny, you staying up top, or are you going below decks? Staying up. Okay. Okay, Kanye immediately takes one of the burned beds because he still wants a bed. And uh, Pedwin, you're down there. You do take note of the some of the spilled ale that's on the floor, and you see the uh, the game board that's been left out. You notice Holg is just face down in between two <laughs> of the tables, snoring very loudly. Uh, Faisal and Big Mo are both towards the the uh, aft of the ship, and the two of them are, are just kind of slumped over and sleeping rather soundly by comparison to Holg against the back wall. I'm going to walk around detecting magic. Okay, you are walking around detecting magic. How many times can you cast that? Uh, it lasts 10 minutes. It lasts 10 minutes? Yep. Ah, okay. So you, uh, you continue to walk around and peruse the ship, but you can detect nothing else on the ship that is magical. But... Oh, it's a relatively mundane ship. I don't think our butts will be magical. Uh, you got a magic oh, butt. But... Sorry, that's not true. You do it's detect my... a, uh, a small hint of magic coming off of Holg's earring. Uh... Is my... Is my butt magical? Can I make his butt magical? Uh, that depends on how you choose to make his Wait butt Wait a minute. I don't like where this is going. on fire, or...? I don't like where this is going. You're the one who wanted the magical butt. Okay, so, everyone settles down for the evening, and goes to bed. Uh, Pedwin takes the last bed, which is the also coincidentally the one that is worse burned. And uh, <laughs> Danny okay. I'm used to it. takes uh, an all-night vigil and watches along with the crewmen up top in the crow's nest. And over the course yeah. of the evening, or over the course of the night, they can see the silhouette of the island, which is still fairly far off, is starting to grow more and more and more, and the star field of the night is beginning to be intruded upon more and more and more by the silhouette of the, of the island itself. Okay. Everyone gets a full rest. All hit die are recovered. All hit points are recovered. All abilities are recovered. And you... They already were. You wake up late in the day. Holg is really hungover. <laughs> he kind of he gets up with a bit of a stupor and cricks his neck, and you hear a couple loud pops. You imagine the floor was not a terribly comfortable place to spend the night. And those of you that were not in beds, you get up and you stretch a little bit, and you're a little stiff in the back. But for the most That's part, that's what she said. <laughs> For the most part, everyone is just fine. Wasn't so, there, in the morning... Wasn't there a book that we had as well? Uh, you did have a book, yes. Uh, can, before we go, before I, can we go back in time before I go to sleep, and I want to comprehend languages, ritual, that. Or I can do that right now, I'll just comprehend languages, ritual, that. Okay, so you cast Comprehend Languages... 
on the book you found in and amongst the chests in the navigator's cabin. Let's see here. So you uh you ha this is your first time dealing with this spell to my knowledge, yes? Yeah. Okay, so uh tell you what. Can you roll a percentage die? All right. So you're not particularly familiar with the syntax of this language. Uh, also, I'm not certain of the details of Comprehend Languages. Do you immediately know what language it is, or do you just understand it? Uh, you just understand it. All right, so the, uh, the book itself is full of rather strange and uh, esoteric phrases. There's a lot of abstract language put into it, but it seems to talk about uh, the origin of divinity and how the the nature of the gods is such that they individually have power but they as beings that are represented in the world have much greater power and through the actions of their followers gods can come to prominence or they can fade into obscurity and their power waxes and wanes uh, in similar fashions Okay. Okay. It's a crazy book. It's a very, it's a, like a heavy theology book. Like it's clearly for crazy for the religiously crazy minded. People. Yes, that. Okay. So I'm going to just bring everybody to the main deck. Oh, missed Kanye. Okay. All right, so... The captain is once again seemingly completely unaffected by the amount of ale he drank the last night. He just strolls right up on top of the ship, and he seems to be in reasonably good spirits, considering everything that's happened. He takes another look at the main mast and chats with one of the deckhands. Um, Danny, you are close enough to overhear that there's been some damage to the anchorings of the main mast. And it would be damage to the anchorings! Oh my god, the ship's going down! Set it on fire! We need to swim for the shore! Okay. <laughs> no! Don't do that. You're a sick man, steve -O. That's what I was. That is. You found the upper decker. To figure that out. What that? You found the upper decker Steve left in the bathroom. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! I knew something smelled funny. All right. So what's happening? Are we setting the ship on fire? No. You're playing. Oh, okay. <laughs> because you're not setting the fucking ship on fire. That's why. It's the SS Kidney, you can't just go burning it down. I could throw a cannonball through the side. No. No, let's not. This ship and us have been through so much together. I'm a literal catapult. Um, what no, are you guys playing? can I- I'm gonna restrain Joe. What? I- I restrain I Joe. Oh, I played Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, I was like, I don't see you guys in a Steam game, I was confused. I'm from no, we're, destroying uh, we're this ship. God, so, fuck me, I forgot. Solar it's okay, panels. but thanks for the offer. I forgot solar panels. Oh, nice. oh. Not the solar panels. So oh. Dunwood from on the uh, the raised point, he uh, addresses everyone that's on deck. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, bye. User left your channel. So he addresses the everyone channel. on deck. Alright, well why don't we switch to the, uh, you know what, fuck it. Well no, let's switch to D&D &D then, if we're gonna... Lock the channel. You lock that one? I would feel better locking that than the lobby.
Well, you can't just go walk in the lobby. User left Let's all go to the lobby. User left your channel. Channel switched. User joined. I thought we were going to the lobby. <laughs> Uh, actually, I don't think I have. Oh, never mind. I do. User left your channel. User joined oh, God. channel. Oh god. Your channel was edited. Okay, there we go. Captain's right, addressing so the ship. Dunwood addresses everyone on board. And he says, "The state of the ship is such that we cannot sail quickly." I suggest that we head towards the island that we are inbound and seek port somewhere that we can make reparations. That was the wrong word there. Never mind. Repairs. As you... You and your five gold words. As all of you are beginning to approach the island, um, Pedwin, you, you, start to det you start to feel the, the map that you have stowed away in your belongings is beginning to uh, shake. I forgot to do portent for the morning. So there it is. Okay, you do a very quick handstand, and the... <laughs> the, uh, the map actually falls out of your belongings, because it was, it was shaking so, uh, so vigorously. As it lands, it unfurls. It's and fucking magic. You can see that. Oh, what the hell? I can't even. Oh, that's bullshit. Oh god, why are we all in here? Because I gotta move something around. That's bullshit. I can't believe it. it won't do that. Oh god, where am I? I can't see my arms or legs. Oh god, oh, where am legs. I? It's all black! HPG! Where's the teleporter? Why isn't it level 3? <laughs> so, as the... As the map begins to unfurl itself, you can see that what it previously represented is gone. Just completely. Is that us? And... It has been replaced by a very, very small diagram of a ship. <laughs> and other than that, Sick the field what? is is very, very blank. What? What? Why? What's going <laughs> on? And as oh, the baby. as the ship continues to make its way through over the course of the hours, so where it was early morning when you guys have woken up, it uh, as you're you're staring very transfixed at the map, as the ship begins to make its way through the waves towards the island, more of the map begins to come into focus. So the blank area is beginning to make way and indicate diagrams of ocean. Everybody it's a magic map. So whoever listened to Pedwin is... Uh, heads over and begins to watch the the live transformation of what is basically a piece of parchment. It's evil! Set it on fire! It's a marauder's map. <laughs> I'm gonna make a history check on the map. Uh, okay, make a history check on the map. The ship moved. So that's an 18. Uh, that isn't... Why is it an 18? Oh, because of, uh... You get the double proficiency bonus? Yup. Okay. Uh, give me a second here. Okay, I'm gonna have to do map and background. Okay. Okay, that's better. No, the ship moved. What's going on? Well, as you guys are sailing, the ship is beginning to... 
it's moving on the map. Like as you're looking at it, it's moving quite slowly, but it is moving. And you, you're watching this diagram actually shift on the piece of paper. Uh, so what was the history check to determine? What the fuck this thing is, because I thought it was just a map. Now that I see it's magical, I want to know. Uh, so from what... what kind of, what, what, like, I want to know if it's like a map, uh, like a famous map, famous magical object that, like, displays where you're going, or what, um, what it is, and what is it? is it? You've never heard of a map that that changes before, but from what you're seeing, what you're holding, uh, it does seem to be physically representing the the actual passage of your ship through the ocean. And as you begin to become, as you begin to come further and further through, or as you begin to sail for longer and longer, and time passes, and you begin to come closer and closer to the island, the map itself begins to show a graphical representation of the island as it's starting to come into view. I wonder why it showed everything before and not now. It. I'll uh, tell you what. Make uh, make an intelligence check. Or sorry, no, uh, not an intelligence. You did a history before. Yep. Okay, make an arcana check. Boop. <laughs> um. Okay, so from what you can determine, it does seem to be connected to uh, a rather localized proximity. But, in all honesty, you've never encountered an object like this before. You've never seen an object like this before. You've never heard of it. So you don't really know what's going on. All you know is that this map is changing, and it is no longer showing what it did before. So as the ship begins to become closer and closer to the coast, uh, Dunwood calls out to one of his crewmen, Tilly, bring up the dredge line. And Tilly? one of the crewmen, Tilly. 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 Killy? Tilly. Killy. Killy. Vanilla. Killy Wonka, the amazing chocolatier. You mean the killatier? So, the crewman disappears below decks and comes back up with... Uh, a rather lengthy piece of rope with a small weight on the end, and then just drops it right over the side and starts feeding it as it's rolling over. And he just about runs out of rope, and nothing... He's hit nothing. And he turns to the captain and he says, Nothing, sir. And the ship gets a little further along. It's been about 15 minutes or so. And the crewman then perks up for a moment and says, Captain, we've hit seabed. And so the uh, the captain orders the foremast sail to be brought down, and the speed of the ship slows greatly, and now it is being carried by a rather gentle current and is not really changing position very much, and the map seems to... Uh, it seems to represent the fact that it's no longer moving by the fact that the diagram of the ship is no longer moving. Which way is the wind blowing? Uh, the wind was currently blowing in the or to the west. Excellent. So from east to west. I want to get on top of the mass. The, I want to get on top, like as high as I can go on the ship. You want to go up to the crow's nest? Yep. Okay. Pedwin is going to the crow's nest. I'm about to do something extremely stupid. I like the sound of that. Give me a second. Let me find your token. Isn't that the one? Uh fell over? Which one Which one fell over? Uh, nobody fell over, to my knowledge. No, the, uh, didn't one of the masts break? Uh, no, it didn't break, but it is, well, uh, you know what, I'll just, I'll add this bit in here. Uh, so as you make your way up, as you climb the ladder to the main mast, you see that it's, it's taken a bit of a beating. The iron anchors that hold the mast to the ship are deformed and bent some of the bolts that connect right into the mast itself are uh, they've kind of peeled out a little bit out of position and they're they're showing some strain against the wood the wood itself has uh, splintered in quite a few places it's not a lot of splinters but it has splintered 
Uh, and you can see that, you know, the mainmast has taken some quite noticeable damage, but it seems to be still structurally sound. Okay. All right, you are on the crow's nest. What are you going to do? Uh, can I get any higher up? Uh, you can... You can tip of the mast. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yep. Good. You can climb to the very tip of the mast, but you're going to have to make an acrobatics check. Mm, I'm going to no, uh, an athletics wanna, check. I'm going to give myself a running start. What? There's I'm... not a lot of room to run. What are you doing? I'm going to... Uh, as fast as... I... I'm going to sprint and leap off the uh, mast, throw my okay. arms wide, and cast Feather Fall so the wind will carry me to the shore. Um, uh, so uh, before you do that, the wind is not <laughs> blowing very hard, and the last time you looked at the map, and just just looking straight out across the water, it's quite a ways to the shoreline. I'll wait until it's not quite quite a ways then. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so the captain who has ordered the foremast to be brought down and has requested this uh, this reduction in the speed, he he gathers his crew, and actually, you know, he gathers everybody. So the the whole party um, is is now standing before Dunwood, uh, and he says. As he's telescoping around, he's like, I see no land to make port along this edge of the I'll coast. I'll find some. We could head south or we could head north. Suggestions. And then he continues to look out as everyone begins to uh, make up their minds. South. South. Do we recall the map at all? Uh, well, everyone but you is currently looking at the map. North. The, North. The, the, the map before it, like, disappeared itself. Oh, um... North. You do, but it was, it was a very, very large representation of quite a bit of the ocean. And you also note that Cinderin wasn't on the map. The area on the map that had the circle and the writing was actually put in in ink, and that is now gone completely. And it was just circling an empty area, and the word was Cinderin, and then a question mark. Mm. Okay, okay. I thought I thought the map was like of Cinderin, but I guess I was wrong. No, the map is not of Cinderin, to your knowledge. Okay. All right, so. Uh, Big Mo has piped up and he's voiced his opinion that the captain should go north. Does anyone else have any a, suggestions? I crossed my arms and said north. He had a character now, can Do rivers flow north or south in this... They flow whichever way the um, land takes them. So. Yeah, rivers have. flow along with elevation. I know, it, but... You're, you're asking generally. about the Coriolis effect? Yeah. Well, rivers are always going to flow according to the land's elevation. Um, the Coriolis effect is extremely weak, and it's not going to be noticeable in a situation like this. Um, if you'd like, you could look over the side of the boat and try and determine where the current is going. We can throw you in, and you can cast Featherfall with the current state here. <laughs> and if you want to do that, I'm going to need you to make a perception check. Let me let me look at uh, catapult. See if I can catapult myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a little bit too heavy for catapults. So you don't quite have the levels for it yet. I could, hmm, I could grab <laughs> onto it mid throw, and that might give me some momentum for feather fall. <laughs> oh god, this is a great idea. Okay, so while Joe is. Contemplating <laughs> sorry, the math. While Pedwin is contemplating this particular course of action, the captain, who's been looking through his uh, his telescoping spyglass, he snaps it shut and says, "There's a haze 
to the north of the island. I cannot see much further beyond it. But I know such things only occur in calmer waters. So, from what you can determine, the captain's inclination is to go north, because it seems like the, the current is not quite as strong there, and it seems like the waters are not, uh, not quite as active either. Do I have a navigator's... do I have a spyglass thingy that came with the kit? The, the navigator's kit thingy? The navigator's tools do not feature a spyglass. Boo. <sighs> Could I make a spyglass out of ice? Huh? Uh? Um. Okay, Where the hell are that's... you gonna get ice? He's a mage. Frost. He can make it. Uh, can you shape Ray of Frost to do that? Or is it just a line? Let me take a look. See at the description of Ray of Frost. Okay, Ray of Frost. A frigid beam of blue-white light streaks towards a creature within range. Make a ranged spell attack against the target. Uh, it's a beam of blue-white light. It's not seemingly not a physical object. So, probably could freeze something. If you can, if you can put together a way that this is going to form a spyglass, I'll let you do it. But you've got to come up with a, a legit way to do this. You can't just look through a ray of frost. No, I'm not gonna look through a ray of frost. Do we have any? Can I get like a bowl, a wooden bowl? Uh, sure. You would. You've seen many wooden bowls below deck. Can Can I uh, do do the math on the uh, curvature I would need? Uh, you can make an attempt to. I will need you to make. Um, let's see here. Uh, you know what? I'll need you to make an intelligence ability check. Uh, you can get a rough idea, but your numbers are estimates at best. You've never tried this before. Excellent. The best way to figure out how to do something is try it for the first time. I want to get some water in the bowl, in a properly sized bowl. Make two... Two... Two, uh... I want to boil them first so they don't have any, uh... All right, you're you're gonna have to boil wooden. You're gonna have to boil water in wooden bowls very carefully. Very very carefully. <laughs> All right, for the interest of saving time, I'll say you pull this off, and you manage to create a, a rather rudimentary, rather rudimentary and rather poor resolution ice spyglass. I stand which... next to the uh, the captain <laughs> my, with my rudimentary spyglass. <laughs> Why did you just ask pressure. to use his? <laughs> just <did. laughs> I hadn't thought of that. So the captain looks <laughs> very confusedly at the contraption that you've come up with. And then just hands you the spyglass to look through. What do I see? Where are you looking? Oh. Fucking at the island. Okay, so you look out at the island, and uh, you're busy at the. Oh, fucking Stevo! God damn it! What? You're drawing. <laughs> so as you look out at the island, you begin to notice that there, the coast itself is not very high. It does come down into the water. It does seem to have beaches. Um, but definitely nowhere that a ship of the size of the Weaver could make port. It's, it certainly seems relatively easy for people to get onto shore, but the ship itself will have a difficult time. By the way, when Joe stood next to the captain and did that, it totally reminded me of that scene that I just linked like a minute ago. North it is. 
<laughs> All right. So the captain takes the spyglass, takes the spyglass back, and says, "I concur." And uh, the ship. I'll try and make another one now that I've seen his spyglass more more well. The... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, you can make another one real soon. Excellent. Alright, so while this is going on, the ship begins to head north. Uh, and out of your spyglass, Pedwin, make a perception <laughs> check. Let me guess, it gives me disadvantage. You have disadvantage on this perception check. <laughs> can I use portent... You can use portent. To do change one... No, I can just change it and make it. Make the whole thing, ignoring... Yeah, you can replace any attack roll, saving throw, or ability check made by you or a creature that you can see with one of these foretelling rolls. You must choose to do so before the roll, and you can replace a roll in this way only once per turn. So you've got to decide now if you're going to use one of your portent rolls. How close are we to land? Um, you are a good five kilometers. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna bother wasting portent on not being able to see anything. Okay, then make a perception check with disadvantage. Oh, what a... Oh. Oh. Uh... Okay, um... You really can't make out a whole lot. The The image that you're getting is quite distorted, and it's not in a very good resolution. You do see a little further up the coast, and the map changes to reflect that. And from what you can see, there is a small road running along the coast. Dirt road? It's a well-trod path, and uh, and the land... The land closer to the coast just kind of slopes down gently towards it. Uh, the captain, who pulls out his actual spyglass, then takes a look <laughs> out, and he calls up one of his crewmen again to drop the depth line as the ship continues to go further and further forward. I'm liking the, this whole spyglass thing. The crewman, who you've come to know as Tilly, uh, then perks up and says, Captain, seabed approaching. And, Quick, uh, attack the seabed. Keep it away. And as you guys get closer and closer, you begin to notice a change in the color of the water further ahead. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. And, uh, and Joe whips around with his improvised spyglass and takes a look. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to have you roll another perception check. Because seven's not a great number. Okay, ten will do it at this distance. What you do notice is the discoloration in the water is of a much brighter tone. And the, the water itself appears to become rapidly more shallow. It's a sandbar? It is a sandbar, from what you can determine. It's a unicorn. <laughs> okay. So as the ship gets a little bit closer, the it's not that the bottom starts to drag, but the current starts to die off a little bit, because the, the sandbar is slowing some of the flow of the water, and there's... There's a little bit of kind of ebb and flow and back and forth, and the ship begins to slow quite a bit. I so the captain... Hand. Yeah? I use Mage Hand to d dig into the sandbar. Uh, what's the range on Mage Hand? Uh, 30. I probably can't reach the bottom, can I? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say you're close enough now. The intentionally steer the ship rather close. Not close enough to get it stuck, of course, but uh, but close enough to check this sandbar out. Um, so your mage hand doesn't have to go very far. The sand is actually very, very close to the surface of the water. 
And it brings back to you. Drag it along the the bottom as if I were dragging it my hand through the. Uh, and so you're you're dragging the mage hand like what through the sandbar? Through the sandbar as we pass. Okay. Uh, so as you pass by, you see the sand get disturbed and it kicks up and then settles, and it appears that the water in this area is quite calm, and the the layer of water above the sandbar itself is very very shallow. Like, it's maybe, maybe four inches of water. Let's not go in there. We'd crash. The ship would crash. I cast Featherfall on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm, I'm kidding. No, no, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a way to, to pose this. Uh... Did I disturb a kraken underneath the sandbar? You did not disturb a kraken. There, seemingly, there is nothing on the sandbar. It is just the sandbar itself. It is pretty close to the ship, and it does connect directly to the land. So it's at this point that. The captain walks up and addresses your group and says, I, I've i scanned further up, but I still see no sign of port or anywhere that I can dock the ship to begin making repairs. You can continue sailing further around the island, or if you'd like, you can use this piece of land here, this sandbar, to try and make landfall individually. I cannot offer you the assistance of the ship for it can make the distance. But I promise you that I can return to this spot in two days' time to rendezvous with you. Uh, yeah, let's stick on the ship. All right, anyone else have thoughts? JD, Stevo? All off board! You want to go, Stevo? Aw, uh, yeah. All right, we appear to be at an impasse. JD, what do you think? I think JD's sleeping. Uh, can I can I try to convince uh, Holg to come along? Holg has been waiting for an opportunity to get off this ship, so he jumps at the chance. In I'm gonna he, jump off the ship. He Let's literally go. jumps, grabs one of the ropes. Let's see. I, I'm gonna. Uh, that'll do it. So he swings right off the ship, and then lands on the sandbar. I wanna... Turns around, puts his hands on his hip, and stands rather smugly and triumphantly on the sandbar, as he sinks a little bit into the sand and then stops. Well, uh, how close are we to the sandbar? You're pretty close at this point. So can I attempt to run and jump off the ship, and then land on both feet on the sandbar? You are gonna have to make an acrobatics check. Or you can do the same thing that Holg did, which is grab a rope to swing further out. Can we make it athletics instead? Um, if you're going to run and jump, you can do athletics. All right. I'm going to do that then. All right. Make Here an we athletics go. check. Okay. Um, I need you to make an acrobatics check anyway for your landing. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Big Bone oh. takes a mighty run, and he's a very strong guy. So he he gets a great push off the side of the boat and makes a rather elegant uh, arm-sweeping motion as he jumps off, kind of showing up uh, Hulk a little bit. And then he summarily belly flops right onto the water that's above oh. the sandbar and then pulls his head out of the water with a... <gasps> And Hulk has a bit of a chuckle, and uh, and then he sinks a tiny bit lower, and then he kind of he shuffles his feet around so he gets out of the wet sand, and now Hulk and Big Mo are both standing on the sandbar. I look back for any other takers. I'm gonna do. Yo, now's now's a chance for you to do feather fall if you really wanted to cast it that much. I'm, I'm gonna do a quick uh, handstand to ascertain to try and absorb from the universe whether or not it's a good idea to leave the ship. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. So what is the, uh... 
What is the in-game mechanic that you're uh, hinging on here? Uh... <laughs> that one mechanic? Are you doing a straight here? wisdom check? Oh, oh, I see. Okay, alright. Uh, yes, perform a wisdom check. Do, do I get uh, any sort of uh, proficiency since I'm a... Uh... Uh, since you are in a handstand, you get an advantage on this. What the hell is with the handstand thing? Man, I gotta, I gotta absorb the power from the universe, man. So you, you gotta do handstands? The energy of the universe. By doing handstands. Am I getting he, he, uh, He's a little bit of an oddball. He, instead of pulling the energy in through his hands like a spirit bomb, he pulls the energy in through his feet. Yep. Okay. Whatever. I'm. I'm not a magic user. <laughs> you don't. You don't know nothing of these mystical ways, Big Mo. <laughs> so. I, I divine. I divine. What do I divine? Uh, you divine that the sandbar itself is safe. Uh, you detect no hint of menace or threat from the coast or the island itself. Alright, It's another robot. Ah, ah, ba, ba. <laughs> FFS. Okay, I'll read for you, HPG. You type and I'll read. You sense no malice or threat from the sandbar or the visible portion of the island. Kieran P is typing. Why is there a unicorn coming out of the island? There is an vague sense of being watched from further inland where you cannot see. Kieran P is typing. I'm sure you might be able to talk now, HPG. Kanye the Giant hollers loudly and swings off the rope onto the sandbar. Am I still roboting? Nope. Nope. Alright. Uh, and Faisal Camille, he jumps off the side of the boat in the same way that Big Mo did, but being a much more leaf and acrobatic person, pulls off a nice little half flip and then lands very solidly on both feet and starts to sink into the sand a little bit again and he has to pull his feet out of there. It Wait, what type of uh wouldn't he land on his head? No, a half twist. What type of what is Faisal? What class are they? Uh Faisal is a rogue. Okay. Oh and uh, seeing as he's not here, away for so long. Uh Danny also grabs one of the ropes and tries to imitate his uh paladin companion. Uh, but he freezes up a little bit and doesn't let go of the rope in time, and he loses <laughs> some of his momentum, and then splashes into the water just before the sandbar, and then has to swim and haul himself up, and his loot is very wet. Can I do a... Who's left? Can I do an insight on whether or not it seems he's going to come back for us? Uh, you can do an insight check. So, uh, you recall that Dunwood himself seems to be a rather fair individual and uh, rather upstanding and honest. Uh, he also did ask you guys to aid him in his quest to find Burnley. And given that he has no allies on an island he's never been to, he's not, seemingly he's not going to betray anybody. He 
really would much rather keep the people that are seemingly on his side than actively work against them. I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm still not sure I trust him, but I'll I'll, I'll believe in Boff. I believe in Boff. He'll come save us. If this You'll guy believe, in Boff. believe in Boff. Believe in Boff. I'll uh, kind of slowly lower myself off the side of the ship. All right. You slowly lower yourself. I'm gonna boo off the loudly the from the sandbank. I I throw produce flame at him. I duck under the water. <laughs> it's not. I think it, the water is not uh, tall enough. The water's quickly. four inches. I uh, I don't know how quite how thick Stevo's character is. I thought I splashed into the water. No, that was uh, that was Danny. He uh, he missed his swing and then plunged into the water. The rest of you are standing on the sandbank, slowly moving in the direction of the island. Okay, then I'll punch the flame. <laughs> and then quickly put my hand into the water. You take two points of fire damage. I'm okay with that. So, um, as all of as the entire group is walking along the sandbar towards the coastline, uh, Dunwood calls out, "I'm going to circle north around the island. If I find nowhere, I shall come back here. Two days, I promise." And with that, the foremast of the ship is raised again. And the the wind and the current combine to take the ship a little bit further away, and it starts to move off north and eventually out of sight. We're doomed. Whoops. Okay. Big Mo's never doom. So the group of you begin to kind of trudge along the sandbank. And as you do you begin to come closer and closer to the coastline itself. And as you do, you start to see formations of beaches with rocks. You see trees and plants strewn about. Did I bring the map? I think I hope I brought the map. You certainly brought the map. Yeah. Okay, so uh, don't mind the white part. I couldn't adjust the background. I'm uh, and for the time being, I'm only going to include the people that are actually fucking here. What's the white part up there? Wait, Kanye's not here. Uh, it's just background that I couldn't change the color of. Why can we see that big yellow section in the middle? That's the sandbar. Oh, you can was... see the section in the middle uh, because there is firelight coming from there. Oh, okay. I thought it was uh, daytime. I did too. Oh, you're right, it is daytime. I had planned this being night. Okay, give me a sec. Yeah, I'm awake again. <laughs> Welcome back to the land of the living. We're on the island. Yay, island. My arms crossed. I swim across the river. Look, it's Danny Sexbang. Woo! Back to life. Okay, so as you guys are walking up the sandbank that you departed the Weaver from, you begin to get closer and closer to the beach, and as you do so, the sand becomes increasingly firm and, well, less and less waterlogged and soggy. Saga Sand. And as you uh, as you land on the beach, you begin to you begin to note that you know it's it's a relatively soft sand consistency. There are rocky patches here and there, but well, in this case, where Big Mo is standing is it's just normal sand. As you look around, you see a few trees, some of them fallen over, some bushes and shrubs here and there. And uh, as you look further inland, there is what appears to be a small stone ruin made of very dark stone. Dragon glass. Black people bones. All right, so Big Mo, as you come closer and closer. Hang on, give me a second here.
you begin to see the well first off you smell the uh the embers of a fire that was recently lit and what's more is you also notice the distinct odor of blood Burnley was here And as you get closer and closer, you do notice that there is a body laying on the ground. One of those weird fish people? In fact, two bodies as you start to walk into the setting, it's, as you start to walk into the camp itself. Those fish people? It is the same lizard men that attacked the ship. You are able to correctly determine that. Uh, but they are already dead. Something or someone has killed them. Uh, can I look at the wounds? You can look at the wounds. I look at the wounds to try to determine uh, I... the weapon that killed them. Then I need you to make an investigation check. They are. I hate dead. this. I hate this stupid game. They are. Whose very, idea very was dead. it to start? Who? Hold on. Whose idea was it to start taking the second number instead of the first? I guess, because all my rolls today would have been amazing. <laughs> uh, I believe it was brought up by the initial Dungeon Master, whose campaign we started quite a while ago. Uh, Yo, you I, jerk. I asked because people were using... Uh, people were using 3D dice, and it made more sense with 3D dice. And I agree. I like the number that shows up on the die. So what you can determine, Stevo, or uh, Big Mo, is that there are no cuts of any kind. Okay. There are crossbow bolts and severe bruises, but no cuts. Okay. So they were killed by crossbow and punching. Uh, well, crossbow and bludgeoning of some sort. Punching. Uh. Is anyone else doing anything? Because right now, Big Mo is the only one that's uh, investigating. I'm keeping a lookout. I loot the campsite. Uh, okay, then lookout. I need you to make a perception check, and uh, actually, both of you make a perception check because you're both doing stuff. I want to. I want to use my. Uh... You're gonna use portent. No, I'm. I'm gonna use my. Uh, Found a friend. My makeshift. Uh... <laughs> Glass. Okay, make a perception check with disadvantage. Do I get a bonus? Because you just I'm get you. Glass? No, you you choose the portent roll that you want right now, and then that's going to be your result unless you get a better one. Oh no, I think it's you have to use that no matter what. Yeah, you have to use it no matter what. Okay, so choose which portent roll you want to use. So that becomes uh, perception nineteen. Wait, how does it become nineteen? Uh, you add stuff to it. Plus four. Or does it just replace the roll? It just replaces the roll. But what do you get the plus four from? Uh, plus oh, two from your from proficiency and stuff. Plus two from proficiency. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, you are looking where? Also, you guys are further Deeper inland now, so I'll reveal more of the map. Into the island. Okay, so you were looking straight inland? Yep. Uh, okay. You see off in the distance that there is what appears to be a rather dense forest. It doesn't uh, look there, very dense. The, there is a road that is veering north along the coast. And you don't see where it goes, but it's it's clearly the road, and it's going north. Uh, you also see that the the same road then curls inland and is heading further west. And the the turn in this road is actually very close to where you are. As you are doing this, you trip over part of the shrubs that you're on, and you... You actually land against a surprisingly sturdy and hard object. Your makeshift spyglass breaks. Oh. 
But what you do find is that underneath the shrubs that you are right beside is the weaver's lifeboat. Did someone call that, or did someone call that? It appears to have been rather hastily stashed. I'm going to search the lifeboat for the other boot. Uh, you search the lifeboat, and you do not find the other boot. Oh. The battle axe yes. in there? <laughs> there is nothing in the lifeboat. Damn. Just I want that axe. Oh, I should probably make this fucking visible. Can you guys see that now? Uh, My little shitty drawing. See what? How's he shit? Oh, I gotta. Oh, fuck. Loosen up, right pineapple here. under the sea. Okay, spy, there, that's spy, better. Spy glass. Are you drinking? That doesn't look like much of a boat. Each. Shut up. It's a boat. It looks like there a we go. leaf hammock. Okay, so, Steve, that, your uh, second perception check, or your perception check is from looking around the camp? Did I roll two? I didn't roll two. No, you did an investigation, you did a perception one. So your perception one is from the camp. Right? Uh, no, the investigation is the camp. The investigation was the bodies. Oh, I didn't roll a second one then. Then what's your perception roll from? When you told me to perception. All right. You so told me. You told me to perception. I did because I did tell you yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and Joe saw all of those things that I mentioned and stumbled across the lifeboat and lost his ice spyglass. And spyglass. from from what you see, uh, there are. It seems like whoever made this camp abandoned it very, very quickly. There are some things strewn about. There's a leftover bedroll that hasn't been packed up. There's a little bit of food that was being cooked over the campfire, which is still there. And at this point, uh, Danny, who I guess hasn't moved, I'm just going to move him. So Danny and Holg, who are also with you, they come up and investigate. And you see Holg is kind of looking around a little confusedly, and he, every so often he's smelling the air. Uh, and he goes over and just eats the food that's right here. Ew, gnarly. You oh. hear him chewing loudly. What a bad time to have a no reason boner. Hulk goes over and uh, and kicks one of these bodies, and confirms that it is in fact quite dead. Uh, he then perks up from what he's looking at, and he steps over the body and then peers very very closely at one of the walls, which now that you guys are closer to, you see are made of very very finely masoned stone, and it is like. These are old stones, but they are still forming these walls. So despite the fact that there has been quite a bit of time that's passed, they are still standing, they are still sturdy. They're not forming a structure anymore, because it appears to have been destroyed by other means, but the walls themselves are still strong. And Holg peers in really, really close to one of the rocks, one of the bricks themselves, and then he kind of leans back in a bit of a surprise and then chuckles loudly and immediately starts to head down the road. Oh, sorry, no, he heads this way, that way down the road. I'm going to follow him. I wanted to go north, but I guess we're going this way. There's water north, Joe. Well, hang on, hang on. I mean... You guys don't have to follow Holg. You have no idea Hulk. what he saw. I'm gonna follow him. I'm gonna jog after Holg and ask him what he's, where he's going, why he's going that way. Ah, uh, so, so Holg turns around. He says, "Oh right, that's one of her tricks." Uh, tell me, you see anything funny on that wall over there? Do 
I see anything funny on that wall over there? You do see a message in a language you don't recognize. That's right here on the inside edge of the wall. Nope. Do I recognize the handwriting? Uh, you do not recognize the handwriting. If, like I said, it's a language you don't know. But you do have comprehend languages, don't you? Yeah, if we wanted to sit here for 10 minutes. Well, or I'm just gonna, old, I'm just gonna ask, it what's it say? It says, and Hole goes back over and then takes a close peer. It says, Hold you stupid lummox, I'm down the road in the village. Oh, is that Bob? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but it's a friend of ours. I follow Holg. If you want to, you guys could go north if you choose. It is Joe very can go north. Joe can go north. I'm gonna follow Holg. Sorry, Joe. It sounds more fun. This guy is most likely to lead me to buff. Danny Sexbang, what are you doing? I am staying on the beach and watching out at the ocean and playing my loot. Already make a performance roll. For nobody that's around. It's practice. It's, it's the egg. Exit music. All the children will gather. Oh, and it is excellent exit music. It is it is rousing enough that everyone picks up their pace a little bit. <laughs> it leaves you behind and, uh, even faster. <laughs> and Holg is uh, is inclined to elaborate a little bit more. He says. Buff's real clever, but he wouldn't do anything like that. He abhors violence. No, that looks like a... Uh... Like what? Aya. Aya? Aya what? what? The goddess of Earth? Or the figurative something of Earth? How could I have A of something uh, if I never had of... anything to begin with? Gaia. You're thinking of that. And that's like, like, Ao, oh, I don't know how you pronounce that name. That's like the, the over-god in the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Aya is a person's name. Aya. Aya what? Aya. Aya what? Hulk shrugs. Dunno, she never says. Most of the time, she's disguised. And I keep real following Hulk. Looking for her. But she usually leaves a sign of her passing. Uh, is there anything anyone else wants to do before you guys carry on down the road? Nope. I've got everything I need. A burnt hand, <laughs> my, my battle axe, and my feet. Okay. Uh, I can't see. I'm blind. What do you mean you can't see? It just it just zoomed zoomed out. So I was in the black again. Oh, I see. Uh, so now that you are on land, you can. Everyone got a glimpse of the area that extends northward. You can see that the uh, the land continues on there. And as you guys are continuing to move down the road, the sun has reached its zenith at this point. It's roughly noon. Uh, there is a pretty nice breeze, so despite the fact that it's a fairly warm day, no one is overly hot. Uh, you do notice that the landscape is very, very verdant and very lush. There's greenery everywhere. Nice thick grass.
Let's get our progress. You can take out the map, and it reflects very much what you're seeing right now. Am I going robot again? You were. Okay. Uh, so, you continue to pass by various fields and small valleys, hills. The terrain seems to be relatively level in this area. And as you're getting closer and closer up, you start to see buildings off in the distance. Now, unfortunately, I haven't, I haven't uh, prepped the zoomed-in map for this, so we're going to have to stay on this screen for a little while. We'll live. What? We'll live. All right. We managed to do Joe's unbelievably one part without a map. Yeah. So, as you guys arrive, you have come across a small farming village. Oh. There seems to be a, a relatively flimsy fence that surrounds a good chunk of it. It seems to be kept. It seems to be designed more to keep in livestock than keep anything out. And off in the distance, you can see uh, you can see a father that's in a foot race with two of his children. You can see. Farmers plowing fields. You see a couple of trails of smoke coming out of some of the buildings, and there is the general bustle of a small community. Do I recognize the uh, architecture? Get it? Get a feeling for where in the world we are. Um. Actually, I'm not even going to make you do an intelligence check. Uh, there is nothing distinctive about the architecture. All the buildings seem relatively recently constructed. They are all made of wood. So you you can surmise from the nearby forest, most likely. Uh, there are only a few stone structures that are in the town itself. Uh, one of them appears to be a rather large temple. And some of the other ones appear to be... Uh, well, one of them appears to be part of the smithy. You can gather that from the large found or the large forge outside, the quenching bucket, the anvil, and the fact that there's a dwarf there, kind of boom, hammering away, boom, at some tool that he is currently working on. Can you make that noise again? Boom. Like it. Any indication as to what the temple is for? What uh, deity? The temple seems to feature many different representations of deities posted along the walls that form it. So it doesn't seem to be associated with just one. Uh, however, on the, the very top of the largest structure that forms the temple, there is what appears to be a human man standing there in a robe. He's got a, a rather pleasant looking face, relatively short beard, and uh, a smile. And th the whole atmosphere of the village is, is quite welcoming. Somebody you've never met before just says hello as he's walking by as he disappears into one of the buildings. Something ain't right here. These people are too friendly. You're it's just a trick. being... Get an axe. You're just being over... Uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Cautious. Yes. You're being overcautious. If you think something is suspect, you can always do a, perform or a perception check. Perception all over their faces. You're gonna perceive so hard. Yeah. Alrighty. Can I do that through the eyeglass? Oh no. I don't Your eyeglass is <laughs> broken. Broke. broke. It would have melted by now, anyhow. Uh. So, as you look around, you notice that further off in the distance is a decent-sized lake. Uh, you know, kind of halfway between a pond and a lake. It's not terribly big, but you can't see the whole thing from here. And there is a small stone structure that borders right on the edge of the water. But it's, uh, it's not a building, it's just kind of a, a platform. But it is definitely constructed. Uh, let me bring up my notes here. Uh, as you are looking around, you can see coming in from the south of the village, 
are a few men that are hauling in their catches. And they are clearly fishermen. They have their tackles and their rods. And they're coming up. And there's about hmm, 16, 17 of them. Some of them have some of their kids. And they are a little, little off-put by a group of people they've never seen before. But otherwise, they just kind of move around you and go about their daily business. And you hear the, the local chatter about the price of ale and who caught the largest fish, who owes somebody else money, what they're getting up to tonight, and just the general banter of, of townsfolk. Can I ask one of them uh, what island we're on? Certainly. So the, uh, the person that you stop, he's one of the fishermen, and his son is by his side. Uh, and he seems a little surprised by your question. Well, you're on Rudam. Can I pull out the map? You can pull out the map. Do, do a big letter? Do the big letters of Rudam appear anywhere on the map? Actually, that is exactly what happens. The large letters Rudam appear on the map, just below the island. Uh, what's more is you now notice that a number of details have shown up on the map. The representations of the fields are there. The small stone ruin that was by the sandbar you guys walked up on has appeared on the map. And you can see the beginning of the forest that the map is representing as well, which you notice on the map has started to grow steadily thicker as it approaches the edge of what you can see. But the village is represented, the buildings are represented, the small lake is represented. Uh, and you do notice that there is a road that seems to extend on the map out of the village further westward. I'm going to keep following Holg. Well, Holg at this point, he has just, he has started to wander around the town, and people are definitely giving him a wider berth. They don't seem to be terribly off-put by humans or even a gnome, but a half-orc is not something they've seen too, too often, especially one of his size. So there are people that are giving him a bit of a, a larger distance. Some people clearly not bothered. Uh, and as you're doing this, a small group of children kind of weave in between the entire group as they're basically just chasing each other, playing tag. And they peel off, running around behind the temple and uh, off towards the lake. The man that you asked what island you're on, he leans in and, and chuckles a little bit musically. Uh, where did you expect to be? Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember the name. Back off and try and catch up with them and wave goodbye. What was the name that, what's his name, said? Cinderin? He shrugs a little confusedly and waves. Are you going to say, are you going to ask him that? Uh, when, when he asked us what were we expected to be, I'm going to say Cindera? Is it Cindera? It is Cinderin. Cinderin. Upon hearing that name, his face goes from friendly to definitely more concerned and a little darkened, and he kind of furrows his brow a little bit. And he says, no, it's not Cinderin. I wouldn't recommend you go there. No one who does returns. I'll say thanks and keep on walking. Is there something you're looking for? Can I I'm gonna I'm gonna describe Navigator Burnley. Did he have any characteristics? I can't remember. I'm gonna try He had one boot. Uh, I'm looking for a man with one boot. And an axe. And a big old battle axe. Now that I have seen. Oh. Is he a friend of yours? Mm. No. Now, he seemed a right strange fella. Only stayed in town a short time. Yep. Do you know where I can find him? Oh, couldn't tell you. I know he stopped in at the general goods store. 
spoke to the smith a little bit. Uh, hey, and you hear him, or you see him kind of wave a hand, and he yells out to somebody, Hey, Morby, what happened to that one boot fella? The half, or sorry, the dwarf that you saw kind of hammering away at that object stops what he's doing and uh, takes a quick look at it and quenches it and then puts it down. And he waddles on over. And you can see that he's a very, very stout dwarf. And he comes up and he goes, huh? What was that? <laughs> what, did I go robot again? No. no. Okay. I was just making fun of you. I like the voices. Thanks. <laughs> Nothing beats Matt's voice, though. No offense, HPG. That's fine. Matt's got a pretty good voice. I don't think I can do a, a southern drawl quite that well. So, uh, you do notice that you've lost sight of Holg while all this has been going on. But uh, the then. dwarf comes up to you. He says, what's this, son? The, uh, the fisherman that you asked the question to, he leans over and he says, uh, that, uh, that fellow with the one boot, where'd he get off to? The dwarf stops for a moment and he scratches his beard, which you notice is a very, very thick beard. He's a prime example of his species, this dwarf. He goes, hmm. I couldn't really tell you. I pointed him to Bull, but after that I think he stopped in at the temple and, uh, and then was on his way. He takes a quick look up and down your party. And uh, he points out the... Steve, you have an axe, right? Yep, battle axe. All right, so he, he points out your battle axe. He says, that could do with a sharpening. How much? Hmm. Tell you what, for, uh, for friends of Thomas here, Ah, screw it. And he just he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out a whetstone, and he just tosses it to you. He, uh, as he does so, he says, save me the trouble, and it's yours. What's he say? That was... What? A whetstone? No, I know, I know what, that, but... What, what did he say when he tossed it? Oh, he, uh, he wants you to save him the trouble, so he... He'll just give it to you if you do the sharpening yourself. Oh. And he goes right back to whatever he was working on. This doom, doom, working amongst the forge, the anvil. Right. Then I'll proceed to start sharpening my axe. Why? All right. The, what, the, the, I like this. The logical town. progression didn't make much sense. What didn't make sense about it? He offered to sharpen your battle axe, and then... No, he said, he no, said he it looks said like it, it could be like sharpened. Use sharpening. Yeah. And then I asked him how much it would cost to get it sharpened, and then he said, he tossed me the whetstone and said, basically said, do it yourself and you can keep I think he was more interested in making sure people's weapons were sharpened than uh, making money. As, as a gnome, this makes no sense to me. Well, as Just you, because uh, he's a gnome. As Pedwin confusedly looks at this, or, or watches over this dwarf, you can see that amongst all the things that are collected around him are primarily farming tools, and plows, all of it very, very well made, but none of it's really built for warfare. And his wife comes out of the shop and, and gives him a little kiss and a little bit of food on a plate, and she just disappears back inside. And you can see that he, he seems quite content with himself. So I think you're pod misjudging people. this town all over. They're fucking pod people. Pod people? Pod people. The Twilight Zone. I wouldn't know. 
They're not pod people. Yes, yes, they are. No, they're I, not. I don't believe you. They're not pod people. I don't even know what a pod person is. He's there one are... of um. I'm trying to remember if there was just one Twilight Zone thing or multiple Twilight Zone things about pod people. What does it matter if he's a pod person or not? He was nice. What do you have against nice people, Joe? Okay, it wasn't... It was Invasion of the Body Snatchers, not... <laughs> not, uh... Twilight Zone. <laughs> there was a Twilight Zone with pod people. <laughs> I don't get what you're getting at. <laughs> Who are these pod people and why should it matter? Well, there's a Twilight Zone where when you fell asleep, aliens took over your body. Sounds like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yep. I don't think that's what's going on here, Joe. Or was that, or was that Invasion of the Body Snatchers, or was that pot, or was that Twilight Zone? I don't remember. I don't know. I've actually never seen a full episode of the Twilight Zone. Oh, you're the worst type of person. <laughs> I haven't seen one in the No. Horses are the worst type of people. What? 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 Hey, horses? Because horses Is... star in the best type of porn. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to say whores or horses? I said horses. Horses are terrible people. You're right, they do make for terrible people. Do you know what else makes for terrible people? One. Mosquitoes. Yeah, they suck. I still say they're pod people. I want to. <laughs> I want to find. I want to find Holg and get out of here. Yeah, let's possible. go. Let's go find Holg again. But I'm in no rush to get out of here. All right. Well, you guys have lost sight of Holg, so you're gonna have to search. That's what we're doing. I'm gonna search. I'm All right. Uh, I would like. Uh, Stevo's role is port is my poor ten to eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can you do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, so long as I'm inside of them. Okay, so everyone that is searching, please make a perception roll. Can I roll just to show Joe how bad his idea was? <laughs> and he should have just given sure. it to himself. All right, Joe, are you ready? I purposefully did it to make Actually, it wait, that's 11. Actually, it, it would 11. be an 11. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so an 11 and a 15. Damn, Joe, you should have saved your 11 for you. I, I wanted to make his worse, not mine better. I am quite surprised that such a thing exists that you control your own teammates like that. But hey, I I think I think it works for anyone you can see, right? Yep. Uh, Wait, so you could do that to an enemy? I can do that to anything that rolls. Any a d20, creature. Anything that rolls a d20 in my line of sight. Starting at second level, when you choose the school glimpse, of the, no, no, no. when you finish a long rest, roll two d20s. You can replace any attack roll, saving throw, or ability check made by you or a creature that you can see with one of these foretelling rolls. Wow! You can affect anybody with that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so as the group of you are wandering around. <sighs> okay. You're taking in the sights as you pass by the smith. You notice there's a sign stuck out front. It's uh, emblazoned in brass and, and very, very highly polished. You can tell it's kind of a point of pride, and it says, Mobby the Smith. Like that. Uh, as you continue to walk around, you see a few other signs. You see Bulls General Goods. Uh, you see the tavern. I think we should check the tavern. Uh, you oh. see the temple. And you get a little bit closer to the lake, and you can see that that stone platform is kind of a, a viewing platform. I want to view from the platform. 
platform. All right. Everybody wants a view from the platform. Wait, what came uh, of our well, perception I think rolls? Let's go into the, the tavern. What came of our perception rolls? Uh, you're looking around the town. Oh, okay. So I'm telling you what came of your perception rolls. I went to the so tavern. So you do spot, uh, you do spot, you know, some of the children are are a little surprised to see a group of strangers that they've never seen before in their relatively small farming village. But for the most part, they're just, you know, amusing themselves doing child things. And we're going to keep an eye on Swift Panda. (laughs) (laughs) So, Steve, are you going to the tavern? Yep. All right. Big Mo disappears into the tavern, which is the second largest structure in the village. That is not a barn. The largest structure being the temple. Where is he, Holg? You see Holg in the tavern. Awesome. Uh, and he is in the middle of an argument. With what? Uh, with somebody else equally as big as he is. You do notice that there is an, a- an empty tankard in front of both of them. And then Holg <laughs> slams his arm down and challenges this guy to an arm wrestle. <laughs> And the two of them immediately begin arm wrestling. <laughs> While like this is going on, the night before, huh? It's like a repeat of the night before. Basically, yeah. From what you can tell, Holg enjoys drinking and enjoys fighting, and those are two things that Holg really likes to do. I bet. And uh, Pedwin, from the stone platform, as you look out across the lake. You notice that in the middle of the lake is a small stone structure. Is it where they keep the pod people? <laughs> it's, com- it's quite flat. Um, it's built on a naturally occurring rock island, but shortly after the rock breaks the surface of the water, it appears to have been cut very, very cleanly and replaced with high-quality stonework on par with what you are standing on that forms the platform. I'm going to go out there and search for the pod people. Uh, so how are you going to get out through the lake? Are you going to swim? Yep. Okay. Uh, I will point out your gunpowder will get soaked if you do that, so you will not be able to construct anything with it until you dry it out. You could always, say, hand it to somebody else and they can hang on to it for you. I'm going to put I'm going to cast Mage Hand and hold it above me. Hold anything that might uh, get wet above me. Oh, that's clever. I like that. Okay, so you cast Mage Hand and you hold the uh, you hold the map, you hold the bag of gunpowder, uh, and anything else that would get damaged from the water. I think that's just about 10 pounds, yeah. And you, uh, and you begin to swim your way out there. Danny, are you doing anything? I guess I'll make my way to the tavern if I haven't already. All right. Danny, make this way to the tavern. Uh, As you push your way into the door, you see Holg slamming down the fist of the guy he's arm wrestling and then raising both arms up in victory. And he's going, "Ah," and pounds his chest once. All right, what did I cut out at? Uh, it wasn't anything important. A round of drinks for everyone, but I will not be paying for any of them. But everyone should get a new <laughs> drink. Uh, at the sound of the first part of your sentence, everyone kind of perks up their head and looks towards you. And then at the conclusion of your sentence, everyone turns back around to what they were doing. Uh, Holg, then, in still arms raised in victory demands that the guy that he beat in an arm wrestle buys him a drink. And the two of them get into a short staring contest, and eventually Hulk just snorts and then turns away and walks back towards uh, Big Mo and Danny. As he gets up towards the two of you, uh, he says, I asked around. Ain't nobody seen anyone match Inaya's description, but I imagine she... uh, doesn't quite look like a self. Well, we also know Mr. One Boot came through. Oh, you mean that, uh, 
That freak with the big X. Yep. He's been here then. Yep. Oh, maybe that's who they're talking about. Huh? Oh, this fool. And he, he waves his hand over towards the guy that he beat. He claims that a man with one boot walked through this town yesterday. Very late in the night. My guess is people around here go to bed rather early. I'll probably work to my advantage. The the sentence that the sentences he's saying now start to kind of trail off, and he seems to very much be talking to himself at this point. Pedwin, you have reached the island, and as you haul yourself up, you shake off some of the excess water, and you uh you are you gonna keep the objects in the mage hand? Uh, I'm gonna grab the bomb, keep everything else in the mage hand. Okay. You pick the bomb out from the mage hand. So as you are, uh, as you're walking back up, or as you're uh, examining the platform, again, you notice that the stonework is not only really high quality, it is perfect. There are no deviations in it. It is perfectly level. You could drop a bead of water on this, and it wouldn't move. I'm gonna... Do I look around and see anything in the immediate area? There is a small collapsed stone in the very center. And uh, it's basically just kind of crumbled into bits. But from what you can tell, it's very, very recent. There's still uh, a small amount of dust collect around, or stone dust collected around the bottom in and amongst larger pieces of stone. I'm going to sit for a while and cast Detect Magic as a ritual. Okay. You sit for a while and cast Detect Magic as a ritual. Uh, we will come back to you very shortly. Uh, anyone in the tavern doing anything? Or anyone in the town doing anything? I'm going to try to make money by playing a song. Alrighty, let's have you uh, perform a perception roll. Or a uh, performance roll. Also remember that uh, what's his face went to the general goods store in the temple. That he did. I'm going to head to the temple then. Okay. Uh, so Holg has sat down and ordered more drinks. So you, you figure that if, you know, when you're ready to leave, you can probably find Holg in the tavern. Uh, so Big Mo is heading towards the temple, and the, uh, the song has managed to attract a couple of people who, you know, they're tapping their toe a little bit, but other than that, they're not really, uh, not really digging the music too much. <laughs> At least this particular song. Maybe you can try again in a few minutes. So, Stevo, or uh, uh, Big Mo, as you, as you gain ground towards the temple and you get closer and closer, you can see that the structure itself is made out of the same very, very dark and finely masoned stone that the ruins were along the coastline. And uh, as you seem to get a hint of, as you were coming closer, there are many different idols to many different gods placed on the pillars that form the wall of the temple. Uh, as you pass through the outer wall into kind of an open courtyard, uh, the stonework is, again, quite good. And there's a bit of a stark contrast because most of the buildings in the city are, or in this village are wood and relatively recently constructed. This seems older and it seems really, really well made. Like it is meant to last and stand the test of time. The main building itself has a large ornate door made of a very dark wood that is dissimilar to that which is used in the construction of the village. I open the door? You can open the door. The door is unlocked. I'll open the door and walk inside. Uh, as you do so, you you press against the door and it's quite heavy and you gotta you gotta give it a good push, but it does give way and open up. Hold on, hold on. HVG, my name's Big Mo. I should be able to push it open with ease. It's a pretty fucking big door. 
How do how do the kids on the island push it open? Who says the kids on the island push it open? Hey, never mind. So you you push these very heavy doors open, and as you do so, uh, there's only one person in the temple at this moment, and he seems kind of surprised that somebody just opened the door. And as you walk further in, you see that the door itself is actually mounted to a, a larger system of gears and chains that are designed to open and close that door. <laughs> so he's a little surprised that just one person just shoved it open. It was unlocked, but usually the weight of the door is enough to deter people from entering when they're closed. Uh, as you do, he, he kind of perks up. He's a very thin individual. He's got some glasses on. He goes, uh, 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 uh. Yes? Man with one boot, have you seen him? Uh, no, I haven't seen a man with one boot. Man with uh, a battle axe? Oh, now that sounds familiar. So we've got uh, new boots which, set the market. Set your weapon down over there. And there is a small, uh, cleared area. I'll set my weapon down for him. Thank you. Do I still... Do I sit down all my weapons, or just the, the battle axe? Just the battle axe? I didn't know you had any other weapons. I have... Uh, two hand axes and javelins. Are they visible? Uh, I would assume the javelin is, but the hand axes I could hide. Okay, then you set down the javelin as well, but oh. the hand axes you managed to conceal underneath your armor. Or you Actually, don't have armor, underneath your furs. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'll go sit next to the guy and ask him if he can tell me anything about... I'll ask him, can you tell me anything about the man with one boot? I mean, the man with the battle axe? Uh, well, he didn't say too much. Uh, didn't have a very high opinion of the bull. But, uh, strangely enough, he demanded a tithe from me. A what? And I'm afraid the temple does not hand out tithes. What do you ask for? Uh, a tithe. It's like, um, it's kind of like collection from the church. So basically, the person, uh, Burnley, uh, asked this guy, or not asked, demanded money from this guy. Oh. What a bitch. He, he's like... not a nice guy. Uh, he said, Sounds which, like which, him. Of course. Which, of course, Rudam's temple is. Sorry, not not Rudam. Uh, which, of course, the Temple of Verdale is is not about to hand out money to people that walk in here demanding it. Like him. Hmm. Sounds like the man with the battle axe. Oh, you know him. Is uh, is he a friend of yours? Uh, friend's not the right word. Oh. I see. Yep. Well. He uh, he had some questions about some of the different shrines and idols placed around the placed around Verdale, but uh, none of my answers seem to be terribly satisfactory to him. It's a shame, really. There's a great wealth of knowledge, and at this point, he seems to be kind of getting into his stride a little bit, and he gr he very grandly gestures around the room, and you take a look and you notice that there are many murals painted all over the walls, but they don't. Not all of them seem to be depicting scenes of gods. Some of them seem to be depicting... Well, one of them is seemingly the construction of the village of Verdale. And some of the other ones are featuring very prominent figures. There is a large city composed entirely of stone in one of the murals. And in... One further towards the back, in a very, very well-crafted and highly detailed one, there is a very large, very angry-looking red dragon that is breathing fire directly down on a man who is clasping an object in his hand, and the fire seems to deflect away from him, but has absolutely 
this thing has laid waste to everything else around it. I ask about that picture. I want to ask about that picture. Oh, yes. This, uh, this one tends to attract the crowds. This is the story of Caristo and his valiant defense of his kingdom from a marauding dragon. Oh, what was its name again? Hmm. Rajax, that was it. And then at the bottom, you can see that he couldn't remember, but he just kind of glanced sideways at the small tag along the bottom of the mural. And it says, Caristo faces Rajax. says that. I'm going to stand up and say, well, I'm going to have to get going. Oh, must you? There's so much to learn about the history of Verdale and all of Redam. Even well before the time of the Sundering. And it, he, he just kind of continues to babble on now, and you see an opportunity for you to kind of sidle out while he's beginning to just basically get into his own stride and talk to himself. I, uh, I don't even try to find an opportunity. I'm just going to walk out. All right, you walk out and you retrieve your weapons and you can hear that this guy is... He's still talking to himself because he's assumed that you're still there. Like, and over here we have the construction of... And then the door shuts. Pedwin. You have completed your... Wait, what was the spell you were casting? You have completed Detect Magic, and you are nearly overwhelmed with the sensation of power that you are feeling. It is an oppressive feeling, and it is, it is actually straining to you to, to try and, and maintain your focus on what it is you are within. But the sense that you get is that it's been there for a very long time and is slowly diminishing. It seems to be very centrally located around the uh, collection of ruins, uh, the collection of collapsed stone in the very center of this uh, elliptical platform on this rock island in the middle of the lake. I'm going to try and dig through it. You're going to dig through stone? Oh, you're going to dig through the ruined stones? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as you start moving the stones, uh, what you realize is that some of them have engravings on them. And as you continue to kind of shuffle them back and forth, you can see that not all of them do, but some of these things are... Quite a few of these are engraved. Make a teleportation room. Do I have any idea what they're engraved with? Uh, they are engraved with what appears to be a language. And as you, uh, can you make an intelligence, or uh, not an intelligence, let's see. History? Uh, no, you know what, let's, let's have you do an intelligence ability check. Okay, very good. Uh, so, you are actually able to start putting the broken pieces that tend to fit back together in roughly the same configuration. You're not building the, the, this object up anymore, you're kind of laying it flat. Uh, and from what you can determine, it used to be a rectangular obelisk that stood vertically and has now collapsed. And in the center, about two-thirds of the way up, is a hole right through the middle. And it is... It is absolutely perfect in its cut. It is the only part of the stone that seemingly has no damage, where everything else seems to be crumbled. Okay, ex explain to me what I'm looking at again. Uh, here, let me draw it out for you on the map. Okay, freehand. Let's get some... I'll just use red for the hell of it. Okay, so... Uh, what you were looking at... Uh, 
Oh, it's a little bit lopsided, but that circle's supposed to be right in the center. And there is an engraving here. And now that you've started to reassemble the stone, you can recognize very vaguely this language. Does it say there are pod people here? Uh, you don't actually, you don't know what this language is, but you know you've seen it before. Is it the language in the book with the crazy people? It is the language in the book that you read before. Let me take a look, see, and detect, like, at, uh... Comprehend languages. Guys, you know what my milkshakes do? Has it... It's been more than an hour since I looked at the thing this morning, right? Oh yeah, it's been several hours. Okay. I'm gonna ritual comprehend languages then. Since okay, you are gonna a ritual... Alright, you're gonna ritual comprehend languages. Uh, Steve-O, do you... Or Big Mo, are you planning on doing anything now that you've left the temple? I'm gonna go to the shops. You are gonna go to the general goods store. Okay, uh... Did you want to wait for Pedwin, or do you want to go there right now? I can go there now. All I'm doing is questioning, so... Okay. So, uh, you walk over to a wooden structure that seems to be titled Bowls General Goods. And you walk right in. This door is significantly lighter than the previous one. Must be well built. And uh, as you walk in, you take in the fact that this building is, it's not a perfect square, it's actually a little bit on the octagonal sides, but the diagonal faces are much, much shorter. So picture a, a square with some of the corners cut off. Uh, it's got a few windows to the outside. There is a, a light scent of incense, and there's a few drapes around it. It's fairly nice on the inside. Conceivably, the person that runs it is doing reasonably well in terms of their business. And as you look around, you do notice one individual, a human, is standing at the desk. And now that he's noticed you, he raises both arms up. Welcome to Bowles General Goods. What can I help you with? Get some Alize. I can buy a General Goods. Alize. Come on, the cannon you gave me, Joe? Do I have gunpowder and ammo for it? Uh, no. I'm not certain where you would have gotten uh, ammunition for a small cannon, and Joe's got the or Pedwin's got the gunpowder. Okay, well, was, I'm gonna like a, a single. There was a single shot, little like very little gunpowder. Yeah. Just like you do a little clicker, and it lights the flame, and it goes poof. Okay, I'm gonna. So you I'm basically gonna... gave him a flintlock pistol. All right. It, so I'm gonna. I don't think it would do more than like one damage to anything. Okay. Well, I'm gonna put the cannon on the on the ground or on the counter, and then ask if he might have anything round that will fit into the end of it. Essentially, ammo. Uh, bull. Well, there's, a little, there's a little ball bearing in there right now. Well, I so want more. Picks up the cannon and he he examines it a little bit and he. He tips it a bit, and the existing ball bearing rolls out. And I catch he... it. Hmm? I catch it. Well, he's picked it up by now. It was sitting on his desk. And he, he picks it up and just examines it very closely. You hear a, hmm. Uh, yes. Yes, I think we do. And he turns around, and he rummages through uh, a chest that's against the back wall. And you do notice that it, the back wall does have barrels and chests and crates and stuff like that, and a small door to seemingly another room at the very back of the store. He comes back with a small bag and puts it down on the desk, and you hear the sound of uh, uh, what sounds like marble or stone or, uh, or metal kind of rolling over itself. And it opens a little bit, and inside you see are a collection of different ball bearings made of different materials. Cool. Ask him how much for the whole bag. 
Oh, for the whole thing, uh, I think ten silvers should do. How many? How many gold is that? Uh, ten silvers is one gold. Actually, that seems a little pricey. Make it five silvers. Okay. Am I able to put one gold on the the counter and How did everyone... purchase the whole bag? He, and you get are? five five in return, five silver in return. So the uh... will he exchange one gold and give five silver in the bag? Bull, he, well, he um, he sees you put down the gold and he says, uh, now. Is this all you would like? Perhaps I can interest you in uh, in some of our provisions. And he, he walks over here and he kind of indicates to a large table of some dried fruit, uh, some cured meats. There's some water skins available. Uh, as he's walking around, he says, ah, we, we do have a, a few bottles of wine that I've managed to keep out of the hands of the tavern keeper. Oh, let's see. And he, as he's he's kind of going around uh, and checking out some of the rest of his inventory. But if uh, if that's all you would like, yes, certainly. Yeah, I think that'll be all. Oh, very well. And he walks back behind the counter. He takes out five silver and he lays it out on the counter so you can see the five silver. And then he pushes the ball bearings towards you and takes the gold piece that you put down on the counter. I'm gonna add a bag of ball. Inventory. No ball is there, bearings. Is there anything else? I did have a question. Uh, have oh. you seen a man with one boot? <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Uh, oh, not a very pleasant fellow. He uh, no. he's been looking for a pair of boots, oddly enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have his. I have his other one, and then I. He uh he also had a few questions. Asked about a map of the island. Uh, Sadly, I don't carry any of those. You would uh, have to speak to the. You would have to speak to Joral in the temple. What kind of general goods store doesn't have maps? This is all a sham. Uh, uh, can I ask him? Can I ask him if he? I, I'm going to ask. Do you do you know where the man with one boot went? Hmm. Well, he seemed very curious about the island in the lake. Uh, and then after I told him that uh, he should speak to Joral regarding the maps, he uh, he left shortly thereafter. He definitely seemed to be in quite a bit of a hurry. Are you looking for him? Yep. Well, if I imagine he's anywhere, he probably would have gone to Mason's Rest. Will there be anything else? Perhaps I can interest you in some of our armor. Uh, he moves over to one of the mannequins that's lining the side of the wall. This was made by my brother-in-law, Mobby. It's very, very fine craftsmanship. He insisted on keeping it in his shop, but I decided that it would be much better suited here. Is Mobby the... the, the Mobby who... is the smith, the dwarf that you met. Okay. Uh... I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I appreciate the offer, but I uh, don't wear armor. Oh, then uh, perhaps we could interest you in some of our weapons. I have a very fine mace here. Again, my my half brother's handiwork. He's quite the craftsman. Not much of a conversationalist, mind you, but I assure you. And he he's gonna go on like this for a while. Uh, <laughs> is he caught up and speak like the temple man? Yep. Can I just walk out? Will he notice? Will he notice if I just walk out? I'm just gonna walk out anyways. It's, it's okay. I'm not a very uh, talkative person. I'm just you're, gonna yeah, walk you're out. You're not a, a very charismatic individual. Uh, yep. So as as you're leaving, you could hear him say, uh, "Oh, but uh, but you haven't seen yet." Uh, and then he is. You just leave earshot, and you've walked out of the store by now. And you swear as the door is shutting, you hear a. Oh. Pedwin has finished casting Comprehend Languages. And the inscription on the stone matches exactly with the note that you found off of Burnley. Oh, it's the same. I can autocorrect. It's the same. Uh... Meant to be comprehending. 
Ah. So, uh, wait, what are you comprehending? It's so hard. It's so hard right now. Um, so you do notice that your, as you're reading through this inscription, which, give me a second here. Uh, as you are going through it, you're actually saying it out loud. I think Carperhand Languages allows you to speak it, doesn't it? I don't. Or is it just that you understand it? You understand any written language, and you know, you understand the literal meaning of spoken language. I understand the literal meaning of uh, both, I think. Okay, so uh, given that it's the literal meaning, it's what you're reading on the stone is worded slightly differently. But it is still basically the the message that you saw scrawled out on that note. What are the differences? It's just a little bit in the wording. There's seemingly nothing. Or I'll I'll just flat out state this. There's no important differences between the note that you have and what you're reading here. It's just a difference between like um, it's just the usage of language, right? Like you can use metaphor and and stuff like that, but you don't understand the literal meaning, or you only understand the literal meaning of, of the written words. I'm going to go and insist. I, ins I insist that I know the literal meanings, because this is the direct source. Okay. Uh, so you can bring up your tattered note. Mm -hmm. uh, so the word hands is, it's not, it doesn't mean physical hands. Uh, it means more like, uh, it means more kind of um, populace, like people. Mm -hmm. So the literal, the literal translation is people. And the yes. Note that I had before was hands. Yes. Okay. Uh, and let's see what else here. So. The last word, drown, that is, that is not drown, that is destroyed. Uh, drown? I don't see a drown. Oh, fuck, that's right. Okay, so you do notice that on this, there is another line that's not on your note. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you actually, you jot down... Uh, I guess I'll just send this to you, you individually. Skip over it. I did, I did. I'm actually really glad you insisted. So the final line is this. But again, you understand. All right, I'll I'll put it. I'll do it now. So that is the last line that's on the inscription. Uh, but drown the literal word. The literal interpretation of that is destroyed. Uh, the weave is, okay, so the word for the weave is kind of a, is a very, very vague term meant to refer to mysticism and magic in general, but it's, it's using it in a very all-encompassing term. So in the same way you would describe a wizard or a warlock or a sorcerer, oh, they're a magic user, it's that kind of all-encompassing term. Yes. Actually, I'm really glad you did that, because that was important. Okay. So you swim back. Uh, you probably cast Mage Hand again. So as you... Uh, 
as you're swimming back, you reunite with the rest of the party. Big Mo has returned and he is now waiting for you a little bit on the impatient side uh, on that stone platform that you were initially standing on when you spotted the island. Holg gets... Er, Holg just stumbles out of the tavern and he is almost tripping over himself and he is challenging anyone he sees to arm wrestles. And he eventually kind of catches sight of you guys and then walks over to you, kind of rubbing one eye. And as he arrives, the first thing he does is belch really loudly. How pleasant. I'm not here to be pleasant. I'm here... To find Aya and uh, Kent. And Cat? He can't. Or oh, someone reported seeing a pretty girl, uh, but she's not here anymore. Must be that a ways. And he just almost falls over again as he kind of leans forward and points down. Well, actually, he doesn't point down the road. He points just to the side of the road because he's clearly seeing double. Let's head that way and away from the pod people. First good idea I've heard all day. And he begins to stumble down the road off in a westward direction. Mage hand and kind of hold him up by the back of his shirt. You slightly right Holg up, and he continues just kind of waddling, stumbling. He's he's managing to stay on his feet, barely, but he's staying on his feet. And he walks down the uh the road westward, followed by Pedwin, and I'm assuming anyone else unless you want to talk about stuff. I gotta keep walking with him. I'm gonna share the poem. The full poem. Okay. Uh, so I will take the opportunity to post that to everyone. So Pedwin describes how the note that he found off of Burnley had this written on it, and the note itself is very old. There's nothing magical about the note itself, it just has this written down. Although, it doesn't have the last line, or the last two lines, Awakened Hearts, from then on, is not included on the note, but Pedwin shares the fact that uh, as he pieced together this stone that was on that small island, uh, he found it. And he, he saw this additional line. And other than that, the only other remarkable qualities of the stone was the fact that it had this hole partway through it. And it was... Seemingly, this stone was one complete slab. It wasn't put together. It wasn't laid like bricks with mortar. It was one complete slab of stone. The only piece on that island that was one solid piece of rock. And Big Mo shares some of the details that he learned walking around the town and asking questions. So he's learned that the temple seems to have a combination of history about the island and worship of different deities. Amongst the ones you can recall, there were deities of the harvest and gods of the sea for the fishermen. There was and. Kanye notes this, there was an altar to Tyr. And at the mausoleum, there was also... Uh, hell, what's it called? Bob. No, there are... Uh, on the mausoleum, where they store some of the more important dead folks, like previous, uh, previous people who uh, tended to the temple, 
there was a statue of Kelimvor. Who I'm just gonna fill everybody in is the deity to which Danny Sexbang has pledged himself, and Tyr is the deity of uh, the god of justice that Kanye the Giant has pledged himself to. And both of fight, those shrines fight, fight. bear the symbols of those gods. So, as you got, well, is there anything else anybody wants to share? All right. So, as you continue down the road, it's now starting to get a little bit later in the day. So the the sun has definitely passed its zenith by now. It's starting to the sky is turning a little bit on the purple, slightly orange side. So you're getting on in the afternoon, or you're getting on in the evening now. It's probably about 6 p.m. And the sun will be going down in roughly an hour or two. As you guys continue down the road, you notice that the forest becomes much, much thicker the further inland that you go. There are small swells and hills here and there, but the topology of the land is relatively even. It's, again, very, very lush and just covered with greenery. If there's not trees, there are just big fields with shrubs. You see some local wildlife, birds here and there are they're singing their songs. Uh, birds of prey are hunting small rodents. You hear the distant hoot of an owl off from the forest. And other than that, it's, it's very, very much untouched wilderness from here to basically as far as you can see. Uh, and just, you know, for the sake of easiness, I'm just going to reveal this part of the coast, which is where the fishermen walked up from. And as you guys are getting further along and the sun is starting to creep lower and lower, you begin to see off in the distance a rudimentary wall. And this one's definitely not meant to just keep livestock in. This is meant to keep other people out. Housekeeping. The, the road that you're on runs smack dab into that wall. And there is a gate standing at the front of the wall. Candy what are you guys going to do? Go up to the wall and say candy gram. Uh, as you go up there, there are a couple of guys in armor carrying spears that don't stop you, but they do stand at attention, and they do stare you down. As you come closer, they hold out their hands to indicate that you should halt. I hold out my hand with uh, produce flame in it, in it and wave hello. I keep the, walking and give one of them a high five. <laughs> the one you give a high five to, you go to slap his hand, and he sidesteps and grabs the top of your hand, pulls you in a circle, and then throws you away from the wall. What is this guy, a giant? He's a pretty big guy. And you did just basically reach your hand out. And I gave him a high five. Him. Well, these are guards. They're not really in the mood to high five random people, especially a group that walks up armed and armored. We're on what seems like an uninhabited island, <laughs> minus the pod people. <laughs> it's not uninhabited. That village you came from probably had up to a thousand people in it. Oh, really? What? You made it sound like there were like ten people there. Oh, then that was my mistake. Especially with the three houses. <laughs> what? That was in that was in the center of town. There was there's farms and barns all around that area. Okay. I'll add to the map for next time. I say Candy Grim again. 
The guard just looks at you confusedly. Put that out. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I, I put it out and I cast it again with my other hand behind my back. The two guards, sorry, more guards walk from the inside of the wall that you couldn't see. So there are now four armed individuals with spears standing in front of you. What business do you have here? We're looking for a man with one boot. Or a man with a battle axe who came by this way last night. Who looks like he used to have one boot. Very shady the guards kind character. of look confusedly at each other. I don't know much about boot, but... If you're looking for men with axes... Well, there's plenty of them up in the logging... Uh, up in the logging camp. And he indicates over to the east, where you notice there is another road that leaves this small walled area that disappears off into the forest. We're talking about battle axes. One of the guards reaches out, or reaches into a, a small divot in the wall and pulls out a large battle axe, like this. Is Hulk sober yet? Uh, Hulk has sobered up enough that he is... He's aware that a fight could start. Does it look like Navigator Burnley's battle axe? Nope, it looks like a regular battle axe. Uh, what was special about Navigator Burnley's? Uh, Burnley's axe was entirely made of metal, and it was mostly very dark blue, portions of it charred black. Well, I'll describe the axe and say, no, it looked like this. The guards seem... Now they kind of talk amongst themselves a little bit. And one of them turns to... Or amongst the group of them, the first that initially uh, tossed Steve or tossed Big Mo away after kind of redirecting his high five, uh, says, We don't answer questions. We ask them. What are you doing here? We're looking for this guy I just described, as I told you a good 30 seconds ago. He chuckles and shrugs. Sorry, mate, but people come in here every day. This is the trading center of Redam. If you're not in Mason's Rest, this is where you go if you want gold, girls, and something to drink. And at that point, Holg perks right up. He is all ears now. I just want he... to deliver my candy gram. The guard nearest to you looks at you and says, What is a candy gram? <laughs> I... Oh, I wish I had passed an agitation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't think you do. No, I don't. I... I... I, uh... Beckon him closer to me. He inches a little bit closer to you. I bring my hand like I'm gonna whisper something into his ear. He puts his spear down and takes out a short sword and then edges a little bit closer. I did. Use my arms to imitate a shark, and I bite him with my arms. You use your arms to imitate a shark, like you you give yourself a hug and you open up your elbows. And with that, I'm going to bed. <laughs> right, good night, User disconnected from your channel. Like I lean, I lean sideways, and one one arm below and one arm above his head, and I kind of gently snap down like a shark. Uh, he's. A little bit confused, and then he he just picks you up and brings you up to his head height. So you're now like mm, two feet off the ground. Your legs are kind of dangling there. Uh, what happened to that produced flame of yours? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I tapped him on the back with it, so his back, so his clothes may or may not have been, may or may not be on fire since I forgot to put it out.
Uh, well, he, he has a very good chuckle at this. And he looks you over and kind of turns you around and he gives you a quick shake. And then he puts you down. He says, nah, I don't think he's got enough gold on him. <laughs> Listen, if you're here to trade, get trading. Otherwise, don't start a what the... And he notices that his cape has caught fire. I'm going to run into the town as fast as I can. You have got to beat Hulk, because the moment he heard gold girls and something to drink, he immediately beelined into the town. I'm gonna, I'm he gonna actually just... Hulk's back. He just pushed a guard. He just pushed him with his great big gray hand and just shoved him in the face out of the way and went immediately into the loudest building he could find. Charge! I'm going to chase after him as fast as possible. All right. Now, the, the rest of the guards seem a little bit on the confused side, but are more concerned with stopping the fire that just sprouted up on somebody. And given that nobody started a fight, they're willing to let you through. Uh, you walk into an area that... The hold on, hold on, land... hold on, hold on. How does catching someone on fire not count as starting a fight? Well, they didn't see the flame in my hand. No, they didn't. Okay. They were just entirely too amused with a gnome that, like, shark-armed this guard on the face and just did nothing. <laughs> so it's a combination of, like, amusement and confusion. Okay. That's convinced these guards that you don't mean any kind of harm or threat. And you start, you kind of get the idea that this place... Everybody just kind of does their own thing here. Because you're looking around and you notice that they're... First off, there's no grass within the walls. It's all, uh, it's all kind of earth or wood chips. And the walls themselves, they're not like they're not really, really strong and sturdy. They're they're more there as uh, uh, something that's imposing to the outside and meant to look threatening. But they're not manned by very many people. There's no turrets or watchtowers. There's just there's a rim that runs around the inside where somebody could stand and look over the edge and theoretically fire uh, a arrow or a bow. You notice amongst all the places that there are minstrels abound and there are there's a small group of people just dancing up a storm, listening to somebody else's music. People are drinking, they're laughing. There are scantily clad girls all over the place. There are court. There are courts. There are horses and carts that are coming in from all four directions. So you guys have actually been like the same door that you guys walked through. Have had other people come in behind you, and everybody seems to be there for a purpose. And nobody really seems to care what it is as long as you're not starting a fight or a fire or a fire. And with that, we will end. Yeah, I was getting tired. I was getting tired too. I, I had so little of this prepared. I did a good job. Yeah.